there was a six-year-old boy by the name of David who was taking a walk with his grandmother. On the way back, they decided that they would detour through the local cemetery. As they were looking at some of the tombstones, the grandmother pointed out to David that the, the first date on the tombstone was the date that the person was born, and the second date was the date that that person had died. Well, David was looking around at the tombstones, and he noticed that a couple of them didn't have any second date. So he asked his grandmother, and his grandmother said, well, those people aren't dead yet. Oh, well, he thought about that. Must have gave it some deep thought, because when he got home, he ran into the kitchen, and he said, Mom, do you know that there are people that are buried in the cemetery that aren't dead yet? Well, we laugh at the boy's comment, but you, there's an old saying that the difference between a grave, a grave and a rut is their dimensions. Mary Magdalene, the women who came to the tomb that morning, the disciples, they were in a rut, for it was the third day after Jesus had been crucified and, and laid into the tomb. Now, the disciples, they're... They're held up in a, a room with the doors locked. They're hiding. They're afraid that could happen to them. They're, they're hiding, but they're also, they're also grieving. They're grieving over having had their Savior, their, their Lord, taken away from them, but they're also grieving over their guilt. You see, they had all deserted Jesus in the hour of his need. Even Peter, who, who promised, Lord, I'll never desert you. I'll give my life for you. Even he eventually not only deserted him, but he denied him three times. Well, that day also, Peter and the rest of the disciples would change because they would be convinced, committed, courageous witnesses of Jesus Christ's resurrection and the message of Easter. This morning, I would suggest to you that the, the message of Easter is actually threefold. As a matter of fact, it could be fivefold, but I, I know I don't have that much time. So I've limited it to three, the most important three, I believe. The message of Easter is victory. It's victory over death. It's over sin and evil. The drama we just witnessed is a bit of a composite of the Gospels, and it's a much condensed version in order for time, but also to, to emphasize the essential truth of Easter, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, death did not come unexpectedly to Jesus. He knew, he knew what was going to happen to him. He told his disciples on several occasions. He pretty much outlined exactly what was going to happen to him. Listen to what he said in the 8th chapter of Mark. He said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and after three days rise again. Now he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this would never happen to you. You see, Peter, the disciples, they, they didn't want to... They didn't want to believe that something terrible could happen to Jesus. They loved him. Well, there's people today who, who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And they offer some various and weak arguments. Some maintain that Jesus never really died from the crucifixion. Now, think about it. He was beaten severely. He bled. He suffered pain. They say, well, yeah, well, he became unconscious from that. The beating that he suffered was a scourging. It's, the, it's with a whip that the cords are laced with pieces of metal and glass that would tear into a person's flesh, sometimes going down to the bone. Some people who were scourged died from that alone. But then he was nailed to a cross. And the guards, in order to ensure that he was dead, one of them took his spear and he thrust it into Jesus' side and out poured water and blood. 
John, one of the disciples that we know was at the foot of the cross, he saw that. He saw Jesus die, and he recorded seeing that water and blood come from his side. Now, he didn't know then, not 2,000 years ago, but we know now that that appears to be what's called the separation of clot and serum. It's strong medical evidence that the person has died. Well, some have argued that the disciples stole the body, and then they claimed that he had rose from the dead. Well, now think about it. If they're hiding, they're afraid that could happen to them, do you think they would go and confront Roman soldiers? Mm -mm. And if they did, if they somehow had managed to steal Jesus' body and start a lie that he had risen, would they have spent literally the rest of their lives telling people a lie and dying for it because every disciple except John was martyred for the faith, brutally murdered most of them. Would you, would you do that? Would anybody do that for a lie that they had started themselves? No. Now, some, some have uh, insisted that the uh, authorities actually stole the body. Now, that, that's kind of silly when you think about it. If they stole the body, don't you think that when the news spread that Jesus had rose from the dead, don't you think they would have produced the body? That would have ended it right then and there. And then there's yet another argument. It's kind of ridiculous, too. It's an argument that the disciples and others suffered from a mass hallucination. That all these disciples, all these other people, had the same hallucination, and it lasted. Lasted not, only, not for a brief period of time, but for years. Furthermore, it was a large number of people. If we read... Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he, he points out that there were over 500 witnesses that saw Jesus after the resurrection alive. And he actually challenged people. He said, most of them are still alive. And so much as saying, now, if you don't believe me, come on down here and talk to these witnesses. Well, of course, the greatest evidence of Jesus' resurrection is the change, the change that he's made in lives, in lives back then, and he continues to change lives right now. For the second message of Easter is grace. The scripture tells us that Jesus told Mary Magdalene, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. Jesus was sending a message to his disciples. He's sending a message to these men who for the last three years, that was the extent of Jesus' public ministry, three years. He was sending a message to these men who had been with him, they had heard him preach and teach like no one ever had before because he spoke with the love and the authority of God. They saw him perform miracles. They saw him heal people. Heal people, open, their, open the eyes of the blind. He cured leprosy. He enabled the lame to walk, to run. He even brought several people back to life from the dead. <laughs> and one day when they're all out in the boat and Sea of Galilee, a storm came up and they became frightened and Jesus, they woke him up and Jesus looked at that storm and he said, stop it. And it did. But these are the same men who all deserted him when the soldiers came to arrest him. But Jesus' message was a message of grace, of forgiveness. He called them brothers. He, he's letting them know right off the bat I still love you, you're forgiven, and I've got a role for you to play because you've got work to do. You're going to, you're going to tell others of my resurrection. You're going to share the good news of who I am and what I've done for them. Well, what is grace, folks? What, what, how, do you dis, how do you define it? 
It's the unmerited, the unearned, undeserved love that God has for us, love that compelled him to send his only beloved son, that whosoever believes in him shall never die but have eternal life. You know, there's a story about a a man who was seen running towards a dock. There's a dock at the edge of the river, and he's running towards this dock. And when he gets close to it, he runs as fast as he can. He leaps over the dock, spreads out his arms, and falls flat on the water about 10 feet from from the dock. He turns around, he swims back, and he does it again. And he does it again. And he does it again. And finally, one of the Men standing there said to him, hey, hey, wait a minute. What in the world are you doing? Well, the fellow answered. He said, a friend of mine bet me a million dollars to my one dollars that I cannot leap over that river. And he said, with those kind of odds, I had to try. Well, folks, the odds of you and I defeating death on our own are insurmountable. We cannot do that. Why? As the scripture says, death is the penalty for sin. Sin entered the world with our very first ancestors. We call them Adam and Eve. And ever since, we've had that sinful nature within us. Now, we can strive to do the right thing, but you know what? We cannot do enough good things to counteract the the things that we've, we've done wrong. We can't give enough money to church or to charities to buy our way into heaven. There's absolutely no way we can do that. The scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of God's expectation, and the penalty of sin is death. But God in his grace was not going not to let that happen to us. No, he sent his son. He sent his son into this world, the son of God, came into this world, but he took on human flesh. And although he was true God, he was true man. And he endured the same kind of emotions, the same kind of drives. He endured pain, just like you and I endure pain. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to be thirsty, to be lonely, to be dejected. He knew what it was to even die. Now, he did that all without sin. And by being that perfect person, God has accepted him as payment for our sins. It's a wonderful thing. It's hard sometimes to get our our mind around that. Such love is hard to conceive because we really don't deserve it. The only way to receive forgiveness and eternal life is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He paid the penalty for our sin. He died in our place. He gave his perfect life for our sin-filled lives. And by rising from the dead, he defeated death and the grave for each of us. And because he lives, those who trust in him and follow him will live forever. Furthermore, we have the power within us to lead us and empower us to trust him follow him, regardless of what this evil world throws at us. For the message of Easter is also promise. Jesus told Mary, he said, go to my disciples. Tell my brothers that I'm ascending. I'm ascending to my Father. Now, Jesus had already told his disciples that after he rose from the dead, that he would ascend into heaven. Well, they didn't want to hear much less his death, yet alone his leaving, his ascending, his, his going back to heaven to his father. They were, they were disillusioned. They were frightened at the thought. But Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Well, who is the helper? The helper is the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple Wednesdays ago, Reese Turner, in her fine message, she explained to us that while Jesus was on this earth, although he was the Son of God, he had some self-imposed limitations. He was in a human body. And because he's in a human body, he could only be one place at one time. 
Now, wherever he was, he made a tremendous difference. But by sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within each believer, each person who trusts in Jesus, that person has the power of God. He has the wisdom, the leadership, the courage, and the power to be, to be like Jesus. Now, sometimes, my friends, we, we don't feel like that. Sometimes we, we get into a rut. We get into a rut and we, we don't have the peace, the peace of being right with God and right with one another. And, and the peace that comes from being right with ourselves. Now, what can hold us back is various things that, that can keep us in a rut, can keep us in a rut of, of fear, of worry, a bitterness at what people have done to us. It can be a, a, it can be a, a rut of grief. It can be a rut of, of sin, a rut of shame for where we are. But I want to talk a little bit more about the rut of grief this morning. And I just want to say, tell you that it, it's rather personal. So far I've been able to do this without getting too emotional. But I want to tell you this because there might be something this morning that's keeping you in a rut, keeping you from experiencing the peace that, that Jesus Christ wants to give us through the presence of the Holy Spirit, through our forgiveness, through his grace. You see, as, as I'm sure some of you know, that my wife died a little over a year ago when she died, she was in the, the latter stages of dementia. There were times when she didn't know who I was, didn't even know my name. Her memory, was, her memory was almost totally gone near the end. But two days before Jesus passed, something wonderful happened. You see, I was surely in a rut. I knew, I knew death was near. I knew, and I was dreading it. Well, it was evening. My wife, Verna, she was phasing in and out of sleep. She was in the hospital with a hospice bed that we had in our family room, and I was sitting next to her. And uh, I looked over. I, I realized she probably wasn't alert. But I said, Verna, I'm going to read some psalms. And I picked up the Bible, and I read several psalms. I ended with the 23rd psalm, and I closed the Bible set it down on the table, and I, I, I said softly, I guess, uh, well, uh, that's enough for now. And she said, thank you. I was surprised that she was alert. So I thought, well, while she's alert, I'm going to put a CD on the player of some old hymns, and, and maybe that'll, that'll give her some comfort. She loved to sing the old hymns. Well, put the CD on. And I'm not sure if it was the first song or not. I, I, it may have been the second but it was a song that I was familiar with, and Vernon knew it. She knew it well. The song is titled, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Well, in a very soft but clear voice, Verna began to sing along with the CD. Now, if you know me, you know I don't have a very good voice to sing. So brace yourselves. It begins like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. <laughs> she went on to sing the whole song with the CD. I had forgotten the rest of the words. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. I am totally convinced that the Holy Spirit empowered her, empowered her to give me one last witness to her faith in Jesus Christ. My wife knew Jesus. She loved Jesus. She knew where she was going to spend eternity. 
And she lifted me out of that rut because I know where I'm going to spend eternity too. And may, death may separate us briefly, but one day we're going to be together again. Now I'm going to tell you something, friends. I want to tell you, and I, I, I mean this, I have grieved hard at my wife's passing. It's not a lack of faith, it's an act of love. I still grieve for her, but when I get down and I find myself ready to pack it in, I say, uh-uh, uh-uh. Jesus, Jesus died for me, died for Verna, died for each person who trusts in him and follows him. She's with the Lord. And one day I know we'll be together again. Friends, whenever you get into a rut, whether it's grief, whether it's a rut of, of guilt over past mistakes, worry over your health, maybe it's fear of what tomorrow may bring, Remember, hold on to the message of Easter. For the message of Easter is that Jesus, Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, has defeated death for each one of us. And by his grace, we can claim, we can claim that eternal life that he's purchased with his blood. And he has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And that is a promise he will keep until we are with him, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Please stand for a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, risen Lord and Savior, thank you for giving yourself for us and to us. May this celebration of your resurrection bring new life to each of us so that we may leave here rejoicing and fully decided to following you and never turning back. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you'd go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.